for your kindness and allowing us to continue on our study in Romans. The letter to the Romans is by far the clearest presentation of the good news of Jesus that was ever penned by any apostle. And Paul is a master at presenting his case. Romans is broken down very simply. We call it the Roman road. Um, in fact, I, I, I think that the Roman road that, that uh, Kay shared with me is very helpful, very, very helpful. And it, it, I love the way it's put out. Holiness Walk, Struggle Street, Liberty Street, Confession Way. It sounds like the, sounds like the signposts in heaven, you know, uh, where people were living. I live on Liberty Street or I live on Consecration Way. I love that. That's a great, that's a great way to outline. So thank you very much. And we'll, we'll get a chance to make more reference to that later. So Paul, is, as he looks at the story to the Romans, let's for a moment think about who he's writing to. We in the 21st century have things that would be just almost impossible to understand in the first century. We were talking about this just the other day, how our generation, that is the boomer generation, I, I confess I belong to that generation, and uh, for those who are in the uh, the previous generation, my hat's off to you because you really have paved the way and you've set a high bar so that uh, those of you who are in an advanced generation to ours, um, you are much to be respected for all that you have done. But it's not the same. Every generation has its unique features. And so our generation has things like texting and Facebook live streaming and YouTubing, and um, chatting, video chatting, no, video conferencing, oh, and don't forget Zoom Zoom, um, Zooming. So we have things that in our generation are unique to our generation. Um, remember, the post office of Paul State was slow. When they wrote a letter to the Romans, as you'll find in the last part of the chapter, the last chapter of Romans, he sends it by way of a deaconess, and he sends it to Rome, and he would expect that to get there in several months' time, possibly even um, maybe, if he was fortunate, three to six months. All the news was being traveled that way, and it was private mail. There was no such thing as government publicly served mailbox. Oh, well, if you were Julius Caesar, or if you were one of the legionnaires that was a part of the military, yes, you could actually get a letter to Rome in sometimes as, as quickly as three weeks. So um, if you were looking for a day off and you wanted to get a letter to Rome, you better make sure that that day off is going to happen like six months because you needed that much time to get your correspondence and also to get back the answer. Now, why we are talking about things like this is we tend to look at every book in the New Testament with 21st century eyes. And some of us even have 21st century spectacles. I'm so glad these ones don't turn color on you so that they suddenly shift in color. It would be kind of crazy, but they do that when you're outside in the sunlight. And some of you know what, what an advantage that can be when you're driving in the car. But they didn't even have cars in those days. So Paul is writing to a group of Christians and he begins by telling them how he longed to be with them. And little did he know that that prayer of wanting to be with them was going to be amazingly answered, but oh, how God was going to give him the answer. He was going to find himself a prisoner of Rome. He was going to find himself in prison for years because of that prayer request. And we have some of these letters because of that prayer request, because that's what he was doing while he was in prison, writing the prison epistles. They're not called prison epistles just because they, they, some of them start with the letter P. No, they're called that because he was writing in prison. 
And when we look at this account, he outlines the gospel. Why was that so important? Because of a fundamental problem the first century church had was simply this. The church was reaching Gentiles, people who had no concept of the God of Israel. They had never gone to synagogue Sunday school. They had never gone and heard the great accounts of how the Egyptian Pharaoh had made them into slaves and that God had brought them deliverance from Egypt. They had no idea of that. Why? Because that was not their history. And you see, the history is really his story. And his story is about Jesus, the Messiah, who was going to the come as the promised one to fulfill all that was necessary to bring salvation to not just the Jewish, not just the synagogue kids, but to the entire world. And so Paul, as he gets to Romans chapter 10, he's already talked very eloquently about the fact that the whole world is under the penalty of sin, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that there is the wages of sin, which is death. And he says very clearly in the first three chapters, everyone stands condemned. But in chapter four, five, and six, he says there's an answer. And the answer isn't going back to the synagogue. The answer isn't going back to Jerusalem to make your annual sacrifice on Passover. The answer is to trust in the Passover lamb that John the Baptist pointed out when he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so this great divide starts to happen in the church. We find it clearly delineated in Acts chapter 15 as you read the history of the early church. For there were those who were Jewish by background and there were those who were Gentile by background. And all of the Jewish people insisted that the new converts to this faith in the Messiah must be circumcised. Now, we chuckle to think of that this would be possible, but in fact, it was integral in their faith. And let me say, there's lots of Old Testament verses which would say they're not so far off in what they are saying. Now, am I suggesting for a moment that that is the case right now? No. But what I'm trying to say is this first century church, let's be clear, there were plenty of verses that would promote the need for circumcision, both for the Jew as well as the Gentile. Let me give you a couple examples. Genesis 17, when circumcision was first given, this is what the writer Moses says, this is my covenant which you keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, no limits. He that is born in your house and bought with money of any stranger. Whoa, wait a minute. That's a slave. Now, the Bible does not condone slavery. It simply respects the fact that that was a common aspect of society in their day. And it's dealt with in multiple places, but this is not where he's dealing with it. So, and which is not of your seed. He that is born in your house, he that is bought with your money, must be circumcised. This is my covenant, and it shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child, who is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant, my contract. Now, I could give you way more, but I'll just... Read the references. If you want to look at them, you can look at them. Exodus 12, 48. Nehemiah 2, 9 and 2. Ezekiel 44, verses 7. All of these, multiple times, over and over again, the people of God were to be defined by how they appeared outside, outwardly. And there was many other things. However, here's the point. They didn't really get what circumcision was meant to be. King David did. Solomon did. You know, it's rather interesting. King David and Solomon 
said some very profound things. They were the leaders of Israel and they were the most esteemed of the kings. What did King David said? He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He personalized it. He did not go and say, I received my blessing by going into that place of worship and that's where I get contact with my shepherd. No, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. King Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He's not, interestingly enough, I have been yet to able to discover one instance where either the King Solomon or King David ever promoted circumcision. They got it. They realized that faith is way more than the externals. Jeremiah 6.10, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of God is to them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Jeremiah wasn't talking to Gentiles. He was talking to the nation of Israel and calling them uncircumcised of ear. Jesus, when he came, he said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. And then, of course, in Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel says, and he's a prophet in Babylon. Remember, he's, a, he's an exile prophet. He's when the nation of Israel had been taken away in discipline. And he says, I will give them one heart. I will put the new spirit within you. I will take out that stony heart out of flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. A new heart will I give you, Ezekiel 36, 26. A new spirit I will put in you and I will take away the stony heart. I will give you a heart of flesh. He repeats himself twice in two different places. Why? Because he says the essential problem with all mankind, be they Jew or be they Gentile, is the heart is the issue. And the circumcision was to be a matter of teaching about the fact that the flesh was not to dominate our lives, but the Spirit of God was to dominate, the Word of God was to dominate. And so we find that Paul, as he writes in Romans 10, he spends a lot of time talking about the Word. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer is that Israel that all of them might be saved. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They are ignorant of God's righteousness and seek to establish their own righteousness. What is he saying there? He says that when you have a false concept of who God is and how holy he is and how righteous he is, then you have a false concept of your own righteousness. It's so easy. Have you never noticed it? Sometimes you talk to this person and they say, oh, I don't sin. You go, what? Have you ever met a person that said that? No. I've met people that have said that. And they go, yeah, I, I don't sin. And you go, yeah. It's hard to talk to a person that has, has never sinned because the Savior came for sinners. And we like to say that church here is for sinners who are saved by grace and sinners who want to be saved by grace. And that is what he is asking for. And the people of God have a desire to be holy, a desire to long after his righteousness. But in and of ourselves, we cannot do it. All our righteousness, as Isaiah says, is as a filthy rag. So the religious problem, they have a zeal. In fact, Paul says they have a zeal but it's not a zeal. And a zeal means passionate ardor in the things pertaining to God. They have a zeal that he bears that record, but it's not according to God. Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. Do you catch that in verse five? The man who does these things shall live by them. What essentially he says, and this is a direct quote from Leviticus 18 verse five, says, if you want to live by the law, you can live by the law if you obey the law. The problem is 
we can't obey the law. What is the first command? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. I can't get through 10 seconds and without failing on that one right there. You know, and for those of us who want to sleep right now, you're not loving with God with your mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. But that's okay, because God loves us. And he knows that the flesh is weak. That's what he kept saying to the disciples in the garden. He says, oh, you guys sleeping again? <laughs> okay, keep, keep sleeping. It's going to be okay. It's all going to work out. I love the way he, he treats his disciples, because he treats me like that. He treats you like that. He loves us with an everlasting love. He knows our, our weaknesses. And like Paul experienced in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, he says, I asked the Lord three times for this, this thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what that was. It could have been poor eyesight. It could have been a spiritual conflict that he had. It could have been a, a fleshly sin that he kept finding himself over and over again. Do you find that to be the case as a believer? Of course we do. But he says this, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. We have to realize that when we are weak, then we are strong because he works with weak Christians. And that's the grace of God. He, he's not looking for strong Christians. He's looking for praying Christians who know just how weak we are. And so Paul writes to them and he says, Look, at you. there's people that believe that the law will save. He says, first of all, Leviticus 18.5 makes it clear you can live by the law and if you do them. But it doesn't work that way. Now, let's remember what happened when Moses got the law. In Exodus, we have the account of Moses going up to the mountain to receive the law. What's going on down below? Well, we know what was going on because we have the divine record of it. Aaron is fashioning an idol, and he's about to break not only the first command, but the second, which said, make no graven image. And he manufactures this. He says to Moses later on, I just came out of the pot or something. But that's Moses. Aaron's, Aaron's quite the spinner. He's like, he, he should have been working for the politicians and, and spin some of their stories. But... Um, Aaron was wrong, and he knows it. And what happens? As Moses comes down, he shatters the commands, an indication that they had already broken all of God's law by breaking two. And secondly, he then says, who is for the Lord? Do you know what happens on that first day when he brought down the law? He brought down the word of God to the people. And it says they had to execute 3,000 people. 3,000. That's what the law does. It brings death. But I'm going to turn you another passage. In Acts chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, on the first day of Pentecost. And what happens? As the word of God is being given by Peter there at that time, and he says, whosoever calls upon the name, he quotes the exact same verse, by the way, as Romans 10 in, uh, in this particular passage, whoso calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he, and he quotes that same verse from Joel 2. This is verses uh, 13. They both quote it. And then he come to know the Lord. How many? 3,000. 3,000 died with the bringing of the law, 3,000 saved with the grace of the gospel message. There's the difference. And Paul, as he writes to them in Romans 10, he's bringing up, he brings, sorry, I almost lost it. He brings up so many, so many verses from the Old Testament to prove his point. He says, the law, the word that came down, is so different from our word. Why? Well, the word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart. Who said that? Well, actually, Moses said that in Deuteronomy. He said that. He said, choose life and live. Well, the problem is, 
we keep choosing death and sin. And that is not going to bring life. But only when we choose Jesus, then does he bring us the ability to choose rightly and to choose him. And so he goes on to say, the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Isaiah 28, verse 16. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The Jewish person and the Greek person that was in the same church at Rome were struggling because there's the Jewish person and they've got a rich tradition. There's the story of Esther and Purim and that great festival that they have in the month of March, by the way. And then there was Passover, always around April. And they would be continuing to practice these, not in the same way that they had before, because they would recognize that Jesus, the Passover, he has been sacrificed for us, but there was a unique way that the Jewish person would remember. But the Gentile, they'd simply say, Jesus saved me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> and they would say, it's the word of God that has given me life. And yes, I can appreciate these festivals. I can appreciate your wanting to see us become more Jewish in nature, but really, we don't need to. And that was the problem of the early church. Acts 15, big conference to determine it. And what do they do? They give out five requirements of the Gentiles, but those five requirements never deals with the real issue, which was circumcision. They simply avoid it, they sidestep it. Why did they do that? I think they knew that it was going to be a longer problem than they could deal with and they weren't going to confront it head on. Sometimes it's important to confront things head on. Sometimes it's let time have its consequences because God doesn't operate on our time zone. And we're so impatient. I'm so impatient. I want it done not just today. I want it done yesterday. And he says, just bear with us. God has a plan. We've been praying for a revival, and God said a virus. We've been praying for revival, and God said a war. We've been praying for revival. There may be a revival starting, or it may be a fake news revival. The important thing is, God will send revival as he chooses, because it's the Spirit that brings about revival. And I can guarantee you, those people who got saved on the day of Pentecost never came to Jerusalem expecting to walk away filled with the fullness of God in their life, forgiven, cleansed. They came expecting to participate in a Jewish ceremony. And they came away knowing the God of Israel, knowing him like they had never known God before. We know him that way as well. And so, as they, he goes on in verses 14, he talks a little bit about the sequence of salvation. This is important. How shall they not call on him in whom they have not believed? They need to believe to call. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? They need to hear to believe. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And then he quotes Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Paul has already said in Romans 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And this is the gospel of peace, the gospel of good news. And then he goes on to say, but have they... Not all obeyed the gospel? Isaiah says it this way, Lord, who has believed our report? Do you know where he's getting that verse from? That is Isaiah 6. As Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he goes, woe is me, I am undone. And Isaiah 6 then goes on to say, and whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And I said, Isaiah has that coal, that living coal taken from the altar. That's a picture of Jesus, by the way, that's a symbol. The living coal, and he places it on his mouth, on his tongue, and it sanctifies his speech. It makes it possible for him to be a spokesman. And that's what happens 
when we receive Jesus. We become a spokesman for him. And the good news is you're not responsible for how they act or respond to the message. We're only responsible to give the message he's called us to give. And so he says, we bring glad tidings of good things, good things, message of peace. And he says, well, have they, have they heard? Yes, they have heard, but they've refused. And Isaiah chapter six, that passage, the prophet is saying, go tell this people, keep on hearing, but you will not really hear. Keep on, keep on seeing, but you will not really see. And lest they be converted. And you know what happens? Because the people of Israel did not embrace the gospel. The gospel went out to the whole world. And you and I, as Gentile background people, have embraced the God of Israel and have fallen at the feet of the cross and said, Lord, come into my life. And he says, this sound has gone out to all the earth and the words to the end of the world. He's quoting again Psalm 19, verses four, when he says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth uh, shows, the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. This speech that's going out constantly is saying, there is a God of the universe. He's a God of order. He, he's a designer. Look at the design. You don't get a design without a designer. Look at the fact that there is time and space. And he gives us the evidence of that right in Genesis. On day one, this is what I did. On day two, this is what I did. And there are those who would say, well, we can't know whether that was a long age or a short age. My, my understanding of scripture is clear. It was 24 hours. Why? Because time is the critical component. In day one, he makes light. Light can't exist without time, scientifically speaking. Light requires E equals MC squared. The very evidence of Einstein, that great theory, tells us that time is a part of the light sequence. And so somebody says to me, well, Dave, you know that there are stars out there that are billions of light years away. How could that be created in what your Bible says, 6,000 years, 10,000 years, something like that? I go, don't sweat it. My little brain can't figure that out. And I don't think yours can either. Probably bigger than my brain, probably got a lot more degrees behind your name, but you can't figure it out either. And the thing about it is this. If you can't figure the little things out, how do you think you can figure out the big things? You've got a fa you, you have faith. Your faith says the world existed for billions of years. My faith says God told me. And the evidence is clear. I'm a happy person, how about you? <laughs> and the person looks back and they don't know how to answer that. Because the joy of the Lord is your greatest witnessing tool that as a believer we have. And so Paul, as he writes to them, says, I will provoke you to jealousy. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the nation of Israel. And he says, the great point is this. When Christians go to Israel and visit the Holy Land and talk about the love that God has given to us, and they go down to the River Jordan, which is almost a trickle right now, and they see where supposedly Jesus was baptized and it's pretty muddy water. And some of them even get in that muddy water and have a rebaptism. When they do that, the nation of Israel says, I can't get over this. These people just keep coming. What gives? What is, they're following after, they believe that we're following a false Messiah. And they believe that there is coming the real Messiah. Now the problem is, we believe the real Messiah is the Antichrist. And he may be just around the corner. There is one person right now that's being predicted to be the real Messiah. And the red heifers, as we speak, are being tested and proven to see if they will meet the qualifications. This is the first time in human history, recent 2,000 years, where there have been red heifers in Israel. And they're waiting to see if they can ceremonially cleanse 
all the instruments for the tabernacle. And do you know how long it will take to set up and start sacrifice again? Four hours. Do you know why? Because they're not going to wait for the temple to be erected. They will bring the tabernacle from the wilderness, which they have already got. And they will sanctify that and start the animal sacrifice with that. Now, do we really want animal sacrifice? Because that's, to me as a Christian, that's, that's, that's wrong. Because there has been one sacrifice. Hebrews teaches one sacrifice forever. So will God allow it? I have no idea. He's allowed a lot of things to go wrong. <laughs> and so I do not know. But I know this much. We are at the cusp of the return of Jesus. And we have an exciting message to those who are, have no hope. That he is real, the Bible is true, and you can find peace with God if you will believe in his son and turn your life over to him. And so this verse, verse 21, talks about Israel right now. All day long, I've stretched out my hands to this disobedient and contrary people. Isaiah 65, verses 1 and 2. And those hands have the print of the nail in them. And those hands went to the cross for all, including the nation of Israel right now. Oh, what a, you want to pray for revival? Pray for the revival in Israel too. Because there's where you get to see a real revival. We need to see a revival in the north, but we sure need to see a revival in that land as well. May their eyes be opened so that they would see the Savior as he really is. I know it's kind of been a meandering um, visit to Romans chapter 10, but I love the fact that he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. No distinction, not the Jew, not the Gentile, whoever. And when you put your name in that, and say, I'm calling on you with all my might because not, not that my might's going to make a difference, but I'm sincere, I mean this. He hears the sincere prayer of a person who needs Jesus. May there be many who will call and be saved even this time.